Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, this is uh, the last lecture in uh, this year's uh, series of uh, the Israel-Palestine Distinguished Lectures. Uh, and it's my distinct honor to present to you Professor David Myers, uh, who is President and CEO of the Center for Jewish History in New York City. Uh, he also serves as the inaugural director of the UCLA Luskin Center for History and Policy, as well as the Sadi and Ludwig Kahn Professor of Jewish History at UCLA. He has published uh, profusely many books. I will not read uh, all the titles. I would just mention uh, some of his more recent work, um, the, um, Resisting History, The Crisis of Historicism, in German Jewish thought, Between Jew and Arab, The Lost Voice of Simon Ravidovich uh, of 2008, Jewish History, a very short introduction, and The Stakes of Jewish History on the Use and Abuse of Jewish History for Life, uh, just out uh, from Yale University Press in 2018. Uh, today, he will speak to us about where responsibility lies, reframing the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Please help me welcome him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Omer. Uh, it's really a great pleasure to be here, um, especially on the occasion of your birthday today. Um, we may, at the end, join together in singing happy birthday. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'm delighted to be here at Brown, which is the site of um, the renowned site of intense intellectual engagement um, where difficult issues can be discussed openly and critically. And I think we need that spirit uh, to gain some purchase on the issue that I want to talk to you about, um, especially an issue that is so fraught and has been through so many iterations that seem to lead to dead ends. Um, I hope we can perhaps uh, gain some new insight today. Um, the Israel-Palestine conflict often seems to be in a deep and unmovable state of deadlock. Um, hope seems fleeting, and oftentimes I think that the sole exit from that state of despair is to uh, retreat to the contingency of history, the radical contingency of history, the unpredictability of history. We, we, we don't know what will be. Trends seem to be pointing in one direction, and there can be a sudden course correction that confounds our expectations uh, in the most profound sense. In taking on this topic, let me begin by identifying a bit where I come from by way of what we used to refer in the academy as subject position. So um, as Omar said, I'm a scholar uh, of modern Jewish history. Uh, my publications have been in that field. And my research interests have moved back repeatedly between European Jewish history, the history of Zionism in Palestine, back to Europe, back to Israel, Palestine. Um, and now I've been working for a long time on a project uh, that deals with a topic in the United States, a uh, Jewish history topic in the United States. But my field of research is modern Jewish history. Um, I'm an historian who believes that um, our work in reenacting the past, and that's actually a technical term, a term uh, attributed to or made uh, well known by the great mid 20th century English philosopher and historian R.G. Collingwood. Our work in reenacting the past is inescapably rooted in a specific time, a specific place, and in the psychic disposition or temperament of the historian. I'm also a Jew with deep ties to his community, to Israelis, to Palestinians, and to that blessed and cursed land that stands at the heart of my talk today. In making that point, I'm mindful of the fact that an excess of what I call identitarian investment, investing our identity in an historical topic, can lead to gross distortion. But, and this is a big but, <clears throat> when balanced by a commitment to judicious and careful sifting of evidence, such an investment can be a boon 
by opening up new pathways of research or overturning fractured old ones. I guess I'd say that, at least as I see it, it is legitimate for the historian to try to balance the demands of factual accuracy that stand at the heart of our professional responsibility and a sense of uh, moral accountability. Um, which is to say that um, I believe that moral judgment can be part of the framing of the questions we ask um, and the conclusions, uh, the ultimate conclusions we draw about the implications of the past on the present. I understand this is not a universally held view um, and I don't seek to impose it on anyone else, but it is a view that animates me, that sort of balancing act between uh, really the demands of the past and of the present. And that's what brings me now to the question of how do we assign and even understand responsibility in the ongoing conflict between Jews and Arabs, Palestinians and Israelis. This is admittedly an ambitious, uh, perhaps hubristic, and surely foolhardy undertaking. But it very much comports with my own professional and ethical sense of what history is and what it can be, and particularly how it can illuminate the present. So to sort of telegraph now at the outset what I want to argue, um, I think we need a three-dimensional approach, as I call it, to the conflict. One that involves multiple contextual webs and a lengthier chain of causality than is normally introduced in understanding the conflict. Um, I understand that I've just given you a series of mixed uh, geometric and, uh, and spatial metaphors, and I want to try to explain them over the course of the, my remarks, which will be really of uh, an interpretive nature focused less on uh, new research than on uh, a renewed consideration of some rather well-trammeled uh, pathways in the past. But I want to begin by um, recalling the provenance of this attempt to arrive at what I call a three-dimensional approach to the conflict. It actually emerged in the midst of, of a conversation that I had with my wife uh, Nomi Stolzenberg, who is a legal theorist at the University of Southern California Law School, on a walk one fine summer morning in the beautiful Loire Valley uh, in a small town called Chaumousset, when Nomi and I were struck by the narrowness of the historical lens through which some contemporary observers tend to regard the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, I particularly think of those for whom I have limited patience, and if you belong to either of these classes, uh, I, it is nothing personal. Um, I have in mind the so-called Israel advocates, who refuse to acknowledge any trace of responsibility on their side, and supporters of the Palestinian cause, who do the same for theirs. When we were talking and walking, um, we felt the need to push beyond this one-dimensional approach perhaps even to write a small book about it someday, um, and perhaps that will emerge. But what does it mean to move beyond this one-dimensional approach? In the first instance, it means to recognize the limits of a stance of self-justification and ascription of total guilt to the other side. I think that leads, quickly enough, to a two-dimensional approach, which is better, um, but not ideal. Um, such a perspective allows us to see the actions of the two principal actors in the conflict in relationship to one another. Um, it doesn't assume that there is always an e equipoise in the power dynamics between the two sides. It doesn't always assume that, because very rarely has there been a complete balance of power between Jews and Arabs in historic Palestine or Israelis and Palestinians after 1948. And let me try to recall one commemorative moment, um, especially marked last year, that I think can illustrate this point. Uh, let's take the year 1967. 
51 years ago. I think one can accept that Arab states from the time of the creation of the State of Israel would have preferred that that state not come into existence. And in fact, they often spoke and acted hostily to it. One can point more specifically uh, to the threatening actions of Egyptian leader Gamal Abdel Nasser in the spring of 1967 and argue that they constitute a casus belli, uh, a rationale for war. And yet, from the perspective of 50 years, it appears to me at least that the burden of responsibility for the events of 1967, especially when seen through the lens of their aftermath, the highly consequential aftermath, resides with the Israeli side. I'm thinking not only of Israel's surprise attack in response to Nasser's threatening rhetoric on the 5th of June, 67, nor exclusively of the conquest of large chunks of territory from neighboring Arab states. Um, I have in mind, when I think of this claim, uh, the rejection by then Israeli Prime Minister Levi Eshkol of the legal opinion of the legal advisor of the Israeli Foreign Ministry. Uh, his name is Theodore Meron, he's a distinguished international jurist, uh, who opined um, on September 18, 1967, in response to a request uh, from the Foreign Ministry that, according to the 49th Article of the Fourth Geneva Convention, the prohibition on permanent civilian settlers in occupied territories, and this is Meron's view um, verbatim, is categorical and not conditional on the motives for the transfer or its objectives. So according to the legal advisor of the Israeli Foreign Ministry in 1967, a man destined to become one of the most prominent international jurists uh, in the world, uh, the settling of civilians by Israel on the territory that was conquered in 1967 is prohibited as a matter of international law. From Le Eshkol's rejection of this opinion until today, every Israeli government has participated directly or indirectly in transferring settlers to the occupied territories in violation of international law, at least uh, according to this reading that I follow. One consequence of which, and one extremely important consequence of which, is to forestall the right to Palestinian self-determination. And ironically, I must add, to place in long-term danger the survival of Israel as a Jewish state. Now, we could also look to 1947, 48, 50, uh, also a commemorative moment uh, this year and last year, 71, 70 years ago, uh, where I think the moral balance sheet is more complicated. Because it's true that the Arabs of Palestine, from the advent of the first wave of Zionist settlers, um, were, I would say, unreceptive, um, and then by the early 20th century, surely hostile uh, to their arrival, with a few notable exceptions, um, organizationally, such as the League for Arab Jewish Rapprochement. It's true that the Arab states and local groups in Palestine, local Arab groups, refused to accept the United Nations General Assembly Partition Resolution, UNGA 181, on 29 November 1947, that would divide the country into a Jewish and Arab state. And it is also true that some uh, of the local Palestinian Arab population reacted with violence in the immediate aftermath of the United Nations decision, um, on my view, initiating the hostilities that would become the War of 1948. Um, and yet, on the other side of the moral balance sheet, it is true that Zionists came to Palestine uh, with the objective of settling the land, not, to my mind, with the principal objective of displacing Palestinians, um, but nonetheless, that was a consequence uh, of uh, some of the Zionist settlement project. It's also true that they gave voice, especially after the um, violence that broke out at the Western Wall in 1929, 
uh, that they gave voice to the desire to create a Jewish state with a Jewish majority, which the Arab side uh, reacted to with incredulity. Um, in this sense, it's not hard to understand, I think, why the Arab side, Arab side might have reacted with ire to the partition plan in 1947, um, both because they regarded uh, the Zionist ambition to create a Jewish state with a Jewish majority as an act of, um, uh, of uh, audacity, of breathtaking audacity, uh, but also because the UN partition plan uh, bestowed upon a decisive majority of the residents of Palestine, um, uh, nearly two-thirds of the population, 45 percent of the land. That was what was proposed in the United Nations General Assembly partition plan. And it's true that Jewish and then Israeli forces encouraged the flight of and then expelled Arab residents of the land, um, a totaling all, in all likelihood over 700,000 in number, in order to secure victory for the Zionist movement. Now, in the story I've just told, um, there may be somewhat more responsibility given to one side than the other, but I would say um, in the events leading up to 1948, responsibility does not lie exclusively with one side or another. Um, I do tend to think, in the aftermath of 1948, uh, of the words of um, the great and underappreciated Jewish thinker, um, Simon Ravidovich, whom uh, Omer mentioned as, uh, in, in uh, mentioning the titles of some of my books, who analogized the predicament of Jews and Arabs in 1948 to the famous rabbinic case of two people grabbing the same garment, Shnayim al-Khasim Batalit. Um, Ravidovich, um, who was keenly sensitive to uh, the balance of power between Jews and Arabs, um, commented, added a gloss to that traditional formulation of two, it would seem, equal partners grabbing, neither uh, fully securing control of it by saying that in this instance, one has grabbed hold of it, dominates and leads, while the other is led. The first, he said, rules as a decisive majority, as a nation state, the other is dominated as a minority. Um, he was referring to the Jews having gained control of the garment, as it were, uh, of the piece of land, Palestine, um, rendering the Palestinians a, uh, a, um, a dominated minority. And according to his view, from that point forward, Jews now shoulder a large share of responsibility for what transpires. Um, and he added an important point, that um, the long and tortuous journey of the Jews throughout history, marked by persecution and suffering, should have inculcated in them a sensitivity uh, to the suffering of others, um, um, to um, understand the importance of treating others as they themselves would have wanted to be treated on their long historical journey, but often weren't. Now, it would be easy to drill down on this um, and, in a certain sense, remain within the confines of a two-dimensional perspective, trying to gauge which side was more responsible than the other. And in uh, recent moments, I've suggested that the Jewish Zionist Israeli side was more responsible. But what I've promised is a three-dimensional approach. Um, and that's what I want to um, talk about. Jews and Arabs did not surface ex nihilo in Palestine to do battle with one another. Uh, Ravidovich, my hero for today, um, analogized Jews and Arabs to Jacob and Esau, uh, biblical, biblical brothers who were locked in a kind of death grip with one another, neither partner able to finish off the other. Um, but Jacob and Esau uh, had parents. Um, and parents who raised, guided, and positioned them where they ended up. And so it strikes me as both historically accurate and heuristically valuable to reinsert the parent, as it were, one of the parents, into the story, and thereby add a third dimension 
and another link in the causal chain. What do I mean in this sort of series of mixed metaphors? Simply put, Zionism would never have arisen at the time and in the form it did were it not for the persistence and deep structure of European anti-Semitism. At once, uh, the, obje the objection might be raised that this is a banal and all too obvious and irresponsible claim. Some might say, have you not lifted agency from the actual actors themselves? Have I come to uh, scrub Israel and Zionism of responsibility for actions taken in their name? That's not my intent, but I do think it is important to articulate a certain historical and moral conundrum that is hard for absolutists on both sides to grasp. Namely, the Jews are both the victims of long-standing oppression and since 1948, the dominant power that has come to control and then after 67, occupy another people. How did this happen? Um, and I think I'm gonna try and un unpack it by recalling some important historical moments. First, it's impossible, for, as I said, to understand the rise of the Zionist movement without acknowledging the emergence of anti-Semitism, particularly in the late 19th century. It's in that period of time in the 1870s that the very term anti-Semitism is invented by a German journalist by the name of Wilhelm Marr. Um, simply put, the efforts of Russian Jews to remake their lives in Palestine, um, beginning with the first wave of Zionist immigration to Palestine in the 1880s, was triggered, the, these first efforts were triggered by widespread anti-Jewish violence that followed the assassination of the Russian Tsar Alexander II in 1881. It is true that there was a deeply rooted impulse in Zionist literature and historical consciousness known as Shiva Zion, the desire to re return to Zion. Uh, the land of Israel had a treasured place in uh, Jewish historical memory. But the Russian pogroms and the violence that uh, breaks out in Europe actually beginning in the 1870s and picking up in the 1880s were the precipitant to the first aliyah, the first wave of Zionist settlement. In similar fashion, it's very hard to imagine that Theodor Herzl, the founder of political Zionism, would have conjured up the fantastical idea of a Jewish state in 1896, or convened the first Zionist Congress in Basel, Switzerland in 1897, had it not been for the emergence of anti-Jewish sentiment uh, and indeed now named, as I said, anti-Semitism. Uh, that sentiment indeed swept through Central European political culture and society in the late 19th century, affecting uh, the press, uh, social life, um, as well as the political culture uh, of uh, Herzl's formative uh, environment. It really matters little whether it was the Dreyfus Affair in 1894, as used to be thought, or Herzl's awareness of the very um, troubling anti-Semitism of the 1880s associated with figures like Georg von Schoenner, or later Karl Lueger, the mayor of Vienna who ran on an anti-Semitic platform, uh, with whom Herzl fantasized about dueling. It matters little what the precipitant was that pushed Herzl into a frenzied mood in the mid-1890s when he crafted this vision of a Jewish state that would pull the Jews out of Europe. In either case, whether it be Dreyfus or an earlier set of forces, Herzl was driven by fear of the world around him, a collapsing imperial order, a resurgent ethnic and racial nationalism, and above all, an anti-Semitism that sought to exclude Jews from European society and public life really across the continent. I wouldn't want to argue that Herzl was the sole catalyst behind Zionism. Um, he certainly wasn't. Uh, there are many different strands of the Zionist movement, but he did provide a coherent response to the dangers facing European Jewry that became a template for the future. So in this sense, Zionism was not the only factor, but it was 
a key guiding force and condition for Zionism's rise. This, I think, is key. And again, I may be rehearsing known terrain, but it needs to be said as part of this argument. This is a key in understanding the Jews' transformation from a disliked, oppressed, and often beleaguered minority into a dominant majority. And we might analogize this or draw parallels from the experience of um, colonized groups that undergo a process of decolonization in the course of which they themselves become, in some sense, colonizers. Um, some have described the condition of Jews in Europe as a state of inner uh, colonialism. Um, Jews don't have an external power seeking to impose their will on them, but they themselves operated as, very often in Europe in the late 19th century, as a kind of uh, oriental other in the eyes of uh, their host societies, and some have suggested this is a case of inner in uh, colonialism where they act as subalterns, to use uh, language associated with uh, post-colonialism. This analogy um, is relevant in considering the effects or traumas inflicted by the, colonized, the colonizer on the colonized. And here I mean the effects of anti-Semitism as perpetrated by various European peoples uh, upon European Jewry. Now, this is an abstract and perhaps overly general proposition. So allow me, if you will, to make a second historical move um, and to move ahead somewhat in time. Um, I'd like to recall um, a moment uh, whose commemoration, centennial commemoration is uh, soon upon us, the Paris Peace Conference of 1919, which uh, marked the gathering of allied powers that sought to reset the world order after the devastation of the Great War, the First World War. Um, as many of you know, one of the great um, controversial and seminal developments at the Paris Peace Conference was the Treaty of Versailles uh, that brought to an end the state of war between Germany and the Allies and amongst other effects imposed um, uh, uh, guilt for the war, responsibility for the war upon the German side with a very um, uh, substantial um, uh, demand for reparations and compensation. Less known uh, as an outcome of Paris is what's known as the Little Treaty of Versailles, um, which is a reference to the Polish Minorities Treaty uh, of, I think, June 20th, 1919. This treaty and others that emerged out of Paris and in years subsequent that regulated the creation of new states emerging out of the collapsed husks of uh, of once vibrant empires. This treaty represented an interesting moment of opportunity uh, for the Jews uh, and for a principle that many Jews uh, held dear, which is the idea of dedicated rights for national minorities. Well before we had the language and regime of human rights, um, which, depending on one's perspective, emerges, one could argue, in the wake of the Second World War, some argue much later in the 1970s, others argue back in the time of the French Revolution. But let's say human rights emerges as a really s essential feature of international legal discourse in the latter half of the 20th century. Before that, uh, rights was often under, were often under understood in collective terms um, and very much focused on the rights of national minority groups. Uh, the treaties that emerge out of the Paris Peace Conference that regulate the creation of the successor states of, uh, uh, of the collapsed empires um, oftentimes included provisions that touched upon the rights of groups who were not part of the uh, majority 
uh, society or culture in a given state. Um, we're talking about groups that either did not aspire to achieve political sovereignty uh, or felt they could not for one reason or another and focused their attention on achieving the right to regulate their cultural, educational, and linguistic affairs. Um, in the re most robust form, national minority rights would manifest uh, themselves in what was known as national cultural autonomy, which took the form of, at least as a theoretical proposition, state support for cultural autonomy of a national minority within the boundaries of a particular state. So this is something that uh, Jews in the late 19th and early 20th centuries in Eastern Europe uh, very often aspired to, sometimes as an alternative to Zionism and sometimes as part of their Zionist vision, the ideal of national cultural uh, autonomy, the right to regulate one's own cultural, educational, linguistic affairs. Obviously, in the case of Eastern Europe, that meant um, uh, a treasured place for Yiddish language and culture. Um, this idea made its way in some fashion into the little treaty of Versailles regulating the rise of the new uh, state of Poland um, where a large number of Jews live, some 2.8 million Jews out of a world Jewish population in 1919 of about 16 million. Indeed, the second article of the little treaty of Versailles called with an eye on the large concentration of Jews in Poland for the total and complete protection of life and freedom of all people regardless of their birth, nationality, language, race, or religion. Now, there are a number of features of this treaty provision and its implement implementation that are important for our purposes. First, the language of the treaty did not, beyond that passing reference to nationality as part of a series of identifiers, really recognize the national status of Jews and other minorities in Poland. Um, it did not refer to the goal of national cultural autonomy in any explicit sense. Uh, so it was at some level a disappointment for those who had been aspiring to uh, the moment that Paris represented a robust endorsement of the ideal of national minority rights. Second, the treaty provision generated resentment not only amongst Jews but amongst the large uh, non-Jewish population in Poland because it was an imposition on the newly emerging sovereign state of Poland uh, by uh, the Allies and then the soon to be created League of Nations. And it was resented because it theoretically allowed Polish minorities to seek redress at the League of Nations independently of the new Polish state. So a provision built into uh, the little treaty was the right to appeal to the League of Nations for fulfillment, uh, for enforcement of the provisions of the treaty. So on one hand, the Jews were somewhat disappointed that it wasn't exactly as robust an endorsement of the principle, and yet um, Poles, and particularly Polish political leaders, were concerned by, in a certain sense, the degradation of the very principle of sovereignty just as the Polish state was taking rise. Um, however, this theoretically privileged status um, allowing recourse to the League of Nations was mitigated by the fact that Jews, legally permitted to appeal directly, really carried no weight at the League. Um, they did not have a state power to represent their interests, and they had relatively little leverage to enforce their minority rights. Um, so as a result, the effect of the Little Treaty of Versailles, in uh, a certain profound sense, was not only not to protect Jews, it exacerbated antipathy toward them amongst very influential people um, in Poland. Um, and that sense of pique that Polish political leaders had about uh, this principle uh, 
um, I think could be seen in the fact that uh, shortly after Adolf Hitler's ascent to power um, in September 1930, uh, it, it, shortly after Hitler's ascent to power, of course in January 1933, Poland abrogated the Little Treaty, as sort of a new political wind was uh, crossing Europe. Um, the consequences of the failed minority protection regime were particularly dire in Poland, where the largest number of Jews uh, who were killed in the Holocaust were of Polish citizenship um, and were in fact murdered on Polish soil. Now, I don't mean to say that the failure of the little treaty was directly responsible for the murder of Polish Jews, but it surely highlighted a structural vulnerability of being an unprotected and unwanted minority that produced devastating effects. And these effects of being an unprotected minority uh, were not unique to Poland, but really were uh, found throughout uh, the European continent. Now, there's a third feature of the Versailles system that merits our attention. Western countries, such as Britain, France, and the United States, that um, were active players at the Paris Peace Conference, were more than willing to place the demand for minority protections on Poland and other post-imperial successor states. But they weren't so open to the principle in their own backyards. Um, the British weren't so open to uh, uh, in endowing or endorsing such rights for the Irish in the United Kingdom. The United States was not so committed to um, embracing the principle of uh, minority rights for African Americans. Um, they feared, um, as the historian Philippe Sanz has suggested in his magisterial work, East West Street, that a sweeping regime of national minority rights would entail an unacceptable depletion of sovereignty. Um, what we might call a version of legal and political nimbyism, not in my backyard. We're willing to support this principle, at least in part, for these new emerging states, but we're not really that interested in supporting them in our own uh, realm. Now, it may be that the contours of this argument are not yet in focus, so let me attempt to make them clear. First, a potent new wave of anti-Semitism in the late 19th century provided a push to Jews in East and Central Europe to contemplate alternatives to remaining in their birthplaces, including, but not exclusively restricted, to immigration to Palestine. Palestine, as we know, the most significantly significant response to, um, uh, to the wave of anti-Semitism that breaks out in the 1880s, in statistical terms, is migration to the Americas. Um, and then maybe second is uh, migration out of the Pale of Settlement into uh, new urban areas in, uh, in Tsarist Russia. And then third, at least in terms of statistical significance, is immigration to Palestine. But that relatively small immigration will have a, a, a much larger impact uh, on the subsequent course of history than its numbers would suggest in the 1880s and 90s. Um, it is this push out of Europe that brought Jews into direct contact with the local Arab population of Palestine, thereby commencing what would turn out to be a very bitter, bitter battle for control of the land. So that's the first point about anti-Semitism. Second, among the vast majority of Jews who did stay in Europe, were those who advanced the ideal of national minority rights as a means of securing physical security and cultural autonomy. The failure of the minority rights regime so soon after the Paris Peace Conference was an ominous sign, and here this is the benefit of the retrodictive capacity of the historian, the historian's capacity to predict what already took place, it was an ominous sign of the precariousness of Jewish existence in Europe. In fact, the very proposal to grant such rights, national minority rights, deepened hostility toward Jews at home, in their home countries. We see an interesting, I think quite apposite, adumbration 
of the diminished weight given to cultural and re religious rights in a famous document from a few years earlier um, in which Jews appear in a very different role. I'm referring to the Balfour Declaration of 1917. This 67 word statement, very terse formulation, famously expressed the British government's desire to see, quote, the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people, unquote. Interestingly, at the same time, the declaration states that, quote, nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, end of quote. Now, the disparity between these two formulations is striking. Unlike the later Polish Minorities Treaty, the Balfour Declaration did recognize the Jews as a national group, quite explicitly, in an era in which national identity was the currency of the realm. Conversely, the Declaration bestowed on the indigenous Arab community <clears throat> some 90% of the population of Palestine at that time, the designation of non-Jewish communities, referring to them not by, a, um, uh, not by their name, not, not as Arabs, uh, Palestinians comes uh, later as a common phrase, but by reference to the minority population of recently arrived uh, Jews. Moreover, and significantly, the Arab population was to be accorded civil and religious rights, but significantly not national rights. Now, it's true that the British did not uniformly support wholeheartedly the Zionist side. They tacked back and forth between Jewish and Arab sides, reacting to events on the ground. Um, as was the case with Winston Churchill's 1922 white paper in the wake of the riots that broke out in Jaffa in 1921. But the point is that the Balfour Declaration introduced a paradigm of power relations that made clear the benefits of being a designated national entity and the attendant liability of being a non-national entity. More broadly, we might say that the Jews' experience in Europe in the early 20th century, facing a potent anti-Semitism, a brief moment of optimism afforded by Balfour, and then the dire consequences and disappointment of the failed Versailles system, conveyed to them a sense of what they should aspire to and what they should not. That is, having been neglected and mistreated as a minority, they understood the wisdom some at least understood the wisdom, indeed the imperative of being a national majority. Simon Ravidovich, that obscure Jewish thinker whom I favor, summarized the transformation that was underway uh, as part of this realization within the Zionist movement. In a bracing way, he invoked a biblical term from Proverbs, um, by suggesting that Zionists were like an Evid ki imloch, a servant who now comes to reign or rule, to describe Jews who moved from the position of being a minority to a majority, and were placed in a position in which asserting political dominance in their transplanted new environment was, or at least was perceived as the best way to assure their collective existence. Now, there are many other factors at work in understanding the Israel-Palestine conflict, including the role of the surrounding Arab states, Western powers, and the Palestinians' many failings, to which, admittedly, I've given short shrift. I focused on one factor because I think it gets at a larger truth, namely that the Palestinians have borne a heavy price for the Jews' own victimization in Europe in what we might see as a chain of causal aggression. Um, it's possible at this point that I've angered most, if not all of you in the room. Um, uh, I can't say, it sure, surely wasn't my objective, but I did want to adopt a different lens on an old problem to probe the past, to grasp a set of power relations
that is not always evident to the naked eye. I believe such, approach, such an approach allows or perhaps impels us to see more dimensions in the conflict by adding that additional causal link to the chain. Um, overall, I would say um, my, my view is that anyone who regards Israelis uh, singularly, as singularly responsible for the conflict, or for that matter, anybody who regards the Palestinians as singularly responsible, fails to understand the circumstances that placed these two actors on the theater of battle in Palestine. And now, on the verge of conclusion, I'd ask, where do we stand today? How can this historical judgment serve as a source not of self-justification, but of amelioration? And I don't have a good answer to that question, I'm afraid to say, but here are a couple of thoughts. Uh, first, recognizing this wider chain of causal um, connections should alleviate somewhat the burden of guilt that each side ascribes to the other in this conflict. Um, and that may open the possibility of creating a wider and more open frame for discussions of difference. Um, I'm struck by the fact that here at Brown, scholars from different perspectives have been coming together for, I think, three years uh, to talk about, um, amongst other things, the searing psychic wounds that each side in this conflict bears. Um, the Holocaust, um, in the case of the Jews, the displacement or dispossession known as the Nakba in the case of the Palestinians. Uh, Scholars have been coming together to think about um, how to understand um, multiple narratives and even multiple historical truths that um, often clash with one another with an eye, as took place in recent days, to thinking about future scenarios that might be more harmonious than the status quo. To foster greater recognition of the traumas uh, that each side uh, has suffered, uh, the causal forces behind them, the historical connections between them can induce a greater degree of understanding uh, and perhaps even empathy. Um, second, those, let's say, European and more generally Western countries in which Jews dwelt as an unprotected minority those Western powers that did little to uphold the regime of minority rights, I feel have an additional layer of responsibility to commit themselves to a resolution in Israel-Palestine as, in a certain sense, the parents of the conflict, um, including by providing historical validation and financial support to Palestinian refugees, affirming the right of Palestinians to live in freedom and justice in their own country, and also upholding the right of Israelis to dwell in peace and security in their country. And at this point, I must confess that it's not clear what I mean when I say country, um, what the precise geographic contours of that actually are. We can talk about that in just a minute. Now, I recognize that this set of proposals has a utopian quality to it, especially as so few of the local, regional, or international stars are aligned, to put it mildly. But we don't have the luxury of abstaining from trying as historians, as humanists, as humans. We must reframe our perspective, moving beyond the unwinnable game of proving the all-consuming guilt of either Israelis or Palestinians. By recognizing a third link in the causal chain of the Israel-Palestine conflict, we begin to approach a more nuanced approach to the question of historical responsibility. And I think that is enough for today. Thank you very much. Yeah, happy to take any questions. Yes, please. Thank you so much for your talk. Professor Myers, I wonder if you would speak to political violence, the role of political violence its mobilization 
and in particular, um, the mobilization of narratives of insurrectionary irredentism, both from the Palestinian side, but also from a narrative you hadn't fully evoked, namely that of the religious terms of a redemption of the land that predates the secular Zionist narrative that you reference, which as of late has had a disproportionate influence on political discourse within Israel as well as the mobilization of political violence. Hmm, thank you. Uh, so did everybody hear the question it had to do with um, the phenomenon of political violence, which so often is suffused with a kind of religious language, often a messianic language of redemption, um, and which manifests, manifests itself on both or all sides. Um, and um, that uh, religious language of redemption is often mobilized to, uh, to the pursuit of a violent path. Um, and particularly um, in recent years, um, decades, um, that, uh, that affiliation, that, uh, uh, that binding seems to be uh, a more pronounced phenomenon. Um, so I would say several things. One, um, nationalist movements um, very often bear within them uh, that kind of quasi-religious language of redemption. Um, national movements often claim both the antiquity and the sacredness, the sacrality uh, of the nation, um, such that it is surrounded by an aura of, uh, of the holy, um, a, of the exceptional. Uh, uh, and very often the language uh, of nationalist movements is the language of chosenness, um, which of course recalls for us um, much earlier uh, religious text, I'm thinking principally of the Bible. Um, and I think that that uh, language has certainly been part of the Zionist movement. David Ben-Gurion, the founding father of the State of Israel, who uh, imagined himself as far removed from uh, the traditional upbringing um, uh, that he took flight from, uh, very often used messianic language to describe uh, the Zionist movement um, uh, and uh, spoke in quite open terms about uh, kind of transcendent redemption that was uh, uh, unfolding in, in 1948. Um, and that kind of language uh, becomes, in this case and elsewhere, a warrant for uh, virtually um, uh, any um, uh, act, uh, violent or otherwise. Uh, the very um, iconoclastic Israeli religious thinker Yeshayahu Leibovitch um, was very aware of that intermingling of national and religious rhetoric. And already in 1953, in response to um, an Israeli retaliation against uh, a terrorist infiltration, that led to the death of scores of people, I think over 60 people in uh, the Jordanian town of Kibya, uh, called out that impulse um, and said there's something wrong with that intermingling. Um, to be sure, um, on the Palestinian side, there's been a similar, um, um, in some sense, an inextricability of the political, national, and the religious. Um, someone who was very good at um, at using that uh, that often toxic blend to uh, to nefarious effect was the um, uh, Mufti of Jerusalem, uh, Hajamin al Husseini, um, to rally the troops to the cause and uh, summon up not only national pride but also uh, the glory and integrity of Islam. Having said that, I tend to define the conflict but into various stages, and we may be on the verge of another that relates to your question. So I tend to see uh, the first phase of the conflict as a conflict between Jews and Arabs over control of Palestine, 1882, 1948. The second stage, 1948 to 1967, or maybe better, 1978, 79, um, begins with the birth 
in the fullest sense of the Palestinian people through that searing act of displacement. But they disappear from the scene, and the conflict is really a conflict between Israel and the Arab states. With the signing of the Egyptian peace treaty, that conflict is very significantly abated. And once again, or really for the first time, the Palestinians reemerge on the stage, and the conflict from that point until recent times has been a conflict between Israelis and Palestinians. I wonder, both because of trends we see in the Arab world, in uh, the occupied territories, and in Israel, whether we aren't uh, on the brink of a fourth stage in the conflict, um, which may be more devastating than those that preceded it, and that is a conflict between Muslims and Jews. Um, and this speaks directly to your point of that increase in the, um, uh, in the binding of these two discourses together um, to violent effect. Um, and I think there are traces of, well, there are, there are evident dangers on both sides, um, a kind of resurgent religious nationalism that has been a dominant force in Israel since 1967 and the rise of political uh, Islamism uh, in, in the Arab world and the occupied territories. So we may, be, we may be on the brink of a new phase in the conflict that I think will be uh, rife with the kind of re religiously inspired political violence that you mentioned. Um, thank you very much um, for coming and speaking. Um, so I think, and a lot of this is a product of just how Zionist thought develops, but the story that you've told I think is a, a very Ashkenazi story um, of a particularly European Jewish experience that then was translated in part into the conflict and affected the conflict. Um, but it, of course, the other major Jewish migration to Palestine in the 1880s was the beginning of migration from Yemen. Um, and in general, there's a very different story of Mizrahi and Sephardi migration, which even by the time of 1948 is making up a major part of the Jewish-Israeli side of the conflict. And I'm curious how, especially in terms of thinking about responsibility, how the interplay of Palestinian nationalism and other Arab nationalisms, which had causes that included displacement of Mizrahi and Sephardi Jews, fits into this story. Um, and also, other, other reasons that, that those Jews left that didn't have to do with anti-Semitism or anti-Judaism, and how that plays into this framing of the conflict. Well, thank you for that question, um, I, and for calling attention to yet another strand in the narrative mosaic um, that we should all aspire to weave um, in, in, a, in aiming for a, a kind of total history that we know is unattainable, but nonetheless, uh, we should aspire to. Um, um, you're absolutely right in two regards. Um, there was a movement of uh, Jews from particularly Yemen in the early 20th century and then uh, picking up uh, from other parts of uh, the Muslim uh, world um, in the 1940s. Um, in very significant numbers owing to um, uh, 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 a series of uh, political pressures uh, that led to expropriations and, and displacements, um, ultimately prompting the depopulation of Jewish life in the Arab world um, to the tune of some 850,000 uh, Jews of Arab origin, of Arab lands. Um, and that's an important part of the stories um, in uh, sort of the creation of, I would say, the multicultural um, nature of and demograph demographic um, in, uh, problems in the state of Israel. I mean, by that I mean uh, the um, relatively inhospitable welcome uh, uh, provided by the Ashkenazi establishment to Jews coming from cultures that many Ashkenazi political leaders deemed inferior. Um, but I want to just, so it's important, and, and it's also important to note, as you suggest, that um, there were very natural cultural and linguistic ties between Sephardi and Mizrahi Jews already from the early 20th century with non-Jewish Arabs 
uh, cultural elites in the main um, in Palestine, in Cairo, in Damascus, in Beirut, uh, in Baghdad, um, that um, you know, as we recover them, point to alternative possible outcomes, uh, paths not taken, roads not taken. Uh, I think it's really important to think through that. Might there have been, you know, in the counterfactual, what if the dominant factor within a Zionist movement was Sephardi Mizrahi, Arabic-speaking Sephardi Mizrahi? What might it have looked like? That wasn't the case, so we'll go back to the known known um, and uh, the Zionist movement that was dominated by Ashkenazi political elites um, coming from Europe, experiencing um, this uh, uh, series of waves of anti-Semitic rejection. And so I guess what I am saying is that um, in that causal chain, this is very much a European story. It is very much an Ashkenazi story, um, and that has its own, had its own consequences and costs um, within, uh, within the newly created state. I mean, one of them was you know, the, the phenomenon of the Ma'barot, the transit camps to which um, Sephardi Mizrahi Jews were sent. Um, it, I don't know if you're familiar with the um, sociologist Aziza Khazoum, who's written about this very interesting process by which there's a kind of constant orientalization of the next group by the group that's deemed an oriental. So German Jews, once upon a time, in the 19th century, the latter half of the late 19th century, um, at a time of growing European um, imperial exploration of the world, in particular the Middle East, were deemed oriental, or as the very fra famous phrase you may remember, Omar, half Asiatic. Um, they were deemed different as a cultural, ethnic, and significantly racial matter. They then project that orientalization upon whom? Upon those known as the Ostuden, the Eastern European Jews, who come in you know, various waves of migration to German-speaking lands, really from Salman Maimon in the late 18th century up to uh, uh, the First World War. Um, Eastern European Jews, who assume positions of leadership in the Zionist movement, arrive in Palestine and they see another group of Orientals. And so this is a, it's a, it's a constant process of internalization of the epithet, uh, epithet of Orientalism and then the projection onto another. Um, this is part of the, um, I suppose, the uh, psychic wounds of Jewish history over the course of the 19th and 20th century. Not all of Jewish history, it's important to note, is a series of psychic wounds. But this is a process that I think we can see, and that's why my story, I think, is chiefly an Ashkenazi and European one. Yes, please. Um, I have a question, I guess, to... I think the microphone. I have a question. Um, I'm very receptive to, and, and um, this, this third thing that you're introducing, the idea that you know Russian history has something to do with... I'm a Russian historian, so I'm very receptive to this idea. I came, I mean, I've come to Israel-Palestine, studying Israel-Palestine from late imperial Russian history. So it's always seemed obvious to me that this is, has to be factored <coughs> in. And one of the critiques, I guess, I would have of a lot of scholarship on Israel-Palestine is that I don't find it there. It's not, it's not there. So um, I guess the question, and it also is reminding me of that argument that you know, if you want to look who's to blame for the Cold War, it's not the US or the Soviet Union, it's Hitler for inviting the Soviet Union. And so it has this sort of this, what you're saying is, um, has this wonderful quality of opening up all these questions that you wouldn't normally get at. It also seems terribly obvious. Um, so the question is, um, why, why, you know, you're sort of presenting this as, as it's, it's something new. And again, like it's obvious to me, maybe because I study Russia, but I, I guess I'd love to hear you talk about some of the, you know, this sort of thinking uh, about history, but moving forward, if we could have a historiography that gets at, um, sort of includes this other dimension, what are some of the structural, and here I'm thinking about training graduate students, a different kind of history being written about the the conflict. What are some of the possibilities, but also the structural difficulties of writing that kind of history? Right. Um, and you know, I guess one thing I would mention is Israel studies has been on the rise since since the 2000s. Um, 
uh, we had someone come last week to talk about, you know, bringing Israel and, and Palestine studies closer together. Um, again, a, a book that comes to mind as you're talking is Tara Zara's book, um, The Great Departure, which I find wonderful for many reasons. One of them being, it's not easy, she doesn't say this is Jewish history or this is U.S. history. It just is history, but it encompasses all of these things. So uh, I guess, the, you know, the main thing is if you could say some things about um, what are the possibilities, but also some of these structural problems that, that make writing this kind of history that, as I hear you say, brings European, particularly Eastern European history into conversation with Israel-Palestine history. Right. Well, I don't know if this is a structural problem, but it is um, a very evident problem uh, that uh, one um, brooks encountering. Um, which is to say that um, it can be seen, this kind of adding another chain or series of chains to the causal, and add, adding another link to the causal chain, can be seen as an attempt to strip away responsibility from the actual actors themselves. It sort of is mistaking, mistaking uh, the location of agency in this story. Um, and that's something I feel very acutely in, in sort of presenting this. Um, the other thing I just have to reaffirm is I am almost embarrassed to present this talk because it seems so obvious. Um, and yet, because of the trap in which so much, well, in which the two sides, and in a certain sense, the scholarships that attend them find themselves in it has to be said. There has to be some act of, of propelling out of that, that trap, uh, that trap uh, of ascription of total responsibility to the other side. And here I think that it's not, it's not altogether surprising in a world in which scholarship is inescapably inflected with politics that in Israel studies takes rise in a certain sense as a counterweight to a perceived bias in Middle Eastern studies. Um, what, what might it look like? Um, well, uh, I guess I would say that just as we have seen scholarship um, that seeks to cross oceans, um, uh, scholarship that links, um, as we have seen in certainly U.S. history, um, United States and Europe um, in a much more robust, transactional, interactive, transnational way. Um, I think there's um, an obvious benefit in the era of transnational and global history to understand uh, the currents of influence moving in multiple directions between Europe and the Middle East. Um, so I think in a certain sense the time is ripe for this kind of uh, approach to sort of get out of the localism uh, of the moment and remember broader contextual webs that have been lopped off in the name of really, I think, asserting moral virtue um, in, in, in political argumentation and even in historiography. Um, again, the, the, the liability I, I see is, um, and I'm not sure, is that um, it's hard to hold on to this piece that I've suggested, Eastern European, Central European, uh, the, um, you know, the extraordinarily powerful force of anti-Semitism as a precipitant and catalyst, um, and pay careful attention to you know, what goes on at the local level. We have seen, as I guess our, your speaker last week suggested, um, a positive development in that, and Omar and I were talking about this, um, we now actually have scholars who know both Hebrew and Arabic, which itself is um, uh, you know, a significant advance. To then have a, an array of European languages that allow one to widen that contextual web with responsibility is, is an added burden. So I think those are, that, that's a very obvious problem, but the overall payoff of widening the, widening the contextual lens, um, I think, uh, outweighed the uh, possible liabilities. And here I just have to say, um, and I was sort of pushed on this at lunch, that while I believe 
um, much current scholarship is motivated by, well, a fair bit of current scholarship is motivated by clear political objectives. Um, I do believe that we can and should use historical scholarship um, as um, a source of illumination to um, help us think about possible pathways out of quagmires and stalemates. So I want to rescue a, a vision of history as a source of utility in thinking about the present, mindful of uh, the dangers of, uh, of, over, of overdoing it and lapsing into, uh, into highly tendentious um, and, in the worst case, propagandistic scholarship. I want to try and find that sweet spot uh, because I think I think we need all the help we can in pushing ourselves beyond uh, the current stalemate and quagmire, um, locked into that uh, that embrace of uh, of mutual recrimination that offers no hope. Yes, please. Come back. I was thinking of the legal opinion with which you began your talk. Around the same time as that conference at Khartoum, famous three no's, no recognition, no peace, no negotiation. What pathways were open in retrospect that might have been taken in response? In response to Khartoum? Well, I, there is an actual revisionist reading of Khartoum that it wasn't, that there was a yes, but in between the lines of the nose, um, that it actually wasn't as definitive um, as, uh, as uh, some, as, as the conventional reading suggests. And I, I can't say I'm fully persuaded by that. But there is, there actually is a scholarship, uh, Israeli scholarship on that precise question. Um, you know, there, uh, there, you know, we're moving into, in my periodization, um, as we move into the early 70s, we're moving into a period in which Sadat is considering, right? Can we actually move the needle substantially through military conflict or not? Um, you know, even before the Yom Kippur War, he's questioning whether this is possible, whether there are alternative paths, um, decides otherwise, attempts to surprise Israel, take it by storm, uh, early successes militarily before the pushback. This becomes uh, the greatest failure in Israeli intelligence that, that ever was. But there's reflection in the early 70s on the part of Arab states, to, including Egypt, to consider the possibility of, uh, of uh, peaceful, uh, non-military non diplomatic resolutions with Israel. Um, that, I would suggest to you, certainly as a result of 1973, does eventuate in the Camp David Treaty. Um, and that brings to an end, for all intents and purposes, an era of um, hostility and conflict between Israel and her Arab neighbors. The plane of action shifts in this period. So you, you moved me back to the Arab states. I'm shifting back to the territories because I think that's where the conflict moves from this point forward. This moves to a conflict between Israel and the Palestinians. That's where, um, that's where it's really about. And you know, in this period, over the course of the 70s, uh, the bilateral tensions between states um, becomes mitigated. Uh, what we're left with is the problem uh, of 67. Um, and I think for that reason, um, Miron's opinion is, as I think of the consequences, far more significant than Khartoum. Just before I came here, uh, I listened to David Grossman's speech on a commemorative Memorial Day uh, where Israelis and Palestinians bereaved families 
come together. Uh, the alternative to, memorial. To, yeah. Yes, to bereave together the deaths. And, and his speech was about Israel being a fortress, not a home after 70 years. It was a very moving speech. I was wondering that if, if maybe the problem is too much past responsibility and too little responsibility for the future. Maybe what we need is more, being more responsible for the future than for the past. And you, and you allude to that in your end, and I'd like to hear you, you, how you connect the two responsibilities for the past and for the future. The second question, this comes from my, my uh, being an Israeli visiting in the US, it's about the US Jewish community. And I want to hear your opinion about it. Uh, my feeling is that there are three options at the moment. One is being a very pro apac type uh, Israeli. The other is being a very anti-BDS type Israeli. Pro-BDS? Sorry, pro-BDS, pro anti-Israeli. But the third option is withdrawal, simply not engaging in any debate. And I found it intellectually puzzling, but also for me politi politically concerning. I'd like to hear your opinion about that. Thank you. Um, so, the first question about you know, responsibility, what, I'll put it in terms that I don't think you used, but uh, maybe to sharpen the point. Um, shouldn't we really be devoting our attention to thinking about new political pathways for the future and stop obsessing about the past? Because the past can be an, an insoluble burden, uh, a kind of uh, dead weight around our necks. And I do think that that's generally, I, I, well, I do think that there's something to be said for that. Um, uh, I am concerned of a couple of things. Um, one, um, I do believe that the likelihood of any increased understanding between the two sides without an Israeli acknowledgement of uh, the trauma of displacement in 1948 um, is highly unlikely. I, I think we could say to ourselves, let's just move beyond it. In a certain sense, in a certain sense, this was the underlying uh, reading that this, this is the, I think, the attempt of a book that got a tremendous amount of attention here in the States, much less so in Israel, and that's Ari Shavit's uh, uh, book, uh, The Promised Land, where people were shocked by his reportage on uh, the Israeli expulsion in Lida in July uh, 1948, because it was the first time many Americans, American Jews in particular, had actually read about expulsions conducted by the IDF, of course, was based on historical research that was 30 years old. Um, but what was there was we came, an admission, we came, we expelled, um, and now it's time to move on. And I think there are a couple steps missing in that. We came, we expelled, we are here to express our apology, and we will make amends in ways that are significant for you that we feel we can do. Those are the missing links in that chain. So I think in that instance, history is important. I also think, just in terms of, you know, I must confess that um, I'm often struck by um, the fact that um, critics of uh, Israel, and including, but not restricted to, supporters of BDS seem to forget that Jews have been victims of mass violence the likes of which the world has rarely seen, and that this isn't just a matter of um, engaging in uh, a contest of comparative victimization. That violence had very real consequences. It created uh, new templates and models and patterns. And that's what I'm trying to recover as a way of heightening sensitivity. It may have the opposite effect, um, but I guess I think we can't really think through the future without acknowledging some of these psychic wounds of the past, exposing them to the light of the day so that they can be healed and then moving forward. That's, that's the best I can offer in that regard. 
I think your tripartite distinction of American Jewry and its current state is absolutely on target. Um, uh, the first two groups you mentioned um, are probably statistically a minority. Um, I think maybe the most significant uh, uh, plurality of Jews in America, at least those under 30, are those ad adrift or disconnected, um, those for whom it's not that Israel is a source of great pride or, uh, uh, or embarrassment, it's not relevant to their lives. Um, and I suppose from an Israeli perspective, that might be, for some, a cause for concern. Um, I have to say that I, I, I think um, I think the sense of values, uh, the absence of values alignment between Israel and mainly liberal American Jews under 30 um, is profound. Um, and unless and until there's a course correction somewhere, um, I, I don't see that we're gonna, that, that that trend is going to be reversed. I think it doesn't help that uh, the Prime Minister of Israel seems to quite explicitly write off a significant portion of uh, the American Jewish community, um, you know, believing them not to be relevant to his own uh, 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 political well-being. Um, this is, uh, this is a, an important new phase in the history of American Jews as they relate to, uh, as they relate to Israel, and um, I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, you have two um, parties or um, uh, constituencies that can't talk to each other, and then another just saying, I'm, I'm not interested in that, in that fight. That's not my, I don't have a dog in that fight. Yes, please. Um, justice is relative. Um, I don't think this is an instance or case in which we can achieve absolute justice. Um, I used to think, very simply put, um, as, as you know, I mentioned this afternoon in evoking Winston Churchill's famous aphorism, uh, the worst solution or path to justice uh, except for all the others, was through two states, the creation of um, a Palestinian state alongside the state of Israel. Um, to my mind, that assertion of Palestinian self-determination, along with some measure of Israeli acknowledgement of uh, the wound of the Nakba, um, were essential psychological features of advancing to a new uh, uh, state of being and consciousness, a new uh, ability to, uh, to um, uh, countenance living um, somewhat peacefully with the enemy. Um, I'm not sure that that is a possibility any longer, um, that, um, uh, that creating a Palestinian entity out of a portion of the West Bank cut off from the Gaza Strip is a possibility, um, owing to, in a certain sense, the ironic success of the Israeli settler movement. Um, by ironic, I mean um, settlers, I think, have succeeded in uh, erasing the border between Israel and the occupied territories, uh, but ultimately it's a, it's a Pyrrhic victory if their goal is to preserve Israel as a Jewish state. So I think we're entering into a new world um, where um, there will have to be um, some kind of legitimate, meaningful power sharing um, in which I think it's still important uh, the trauma of the Palestinians and their need for affirmation through some form of self-determination be recognized. And I just don't really know what form that that looks like. I think we're hurtling into a tunnel uh, that will be dark for 
a, a, a good long period. Um, and I think no small part of that is due to the fact that Israeli political leaders did not heed uh, the legal opinion of Theodore Marone in, from September 1967. So David, as, as your host, I'll ask the last question. Um, um, you, you drew a sort of large historical arc, and I'd like you to consider some ironies in it. Um, you spoke about the rise of Zionism largely as a result of anti-Semitism. I would suggest that while anti-Semitism was a major component, Zionism was a response to nationalism uh, and grew and developed as a response to many other nationalisms, particularly in Eastern Europe, which were territorial nationalisms, ethnic nationalisms. But Zionism could not implement uh, its nationalism in Eastern Europe. It had to implement it elsewhere because it had no claim on those territories. The implementation of that was facilitated by the Balfour Declaration and the mandate, which incorporated the Balfour Declaration. And so Zionism could uh, transform itself from a national movement into one that used colonial, settler colonial um, um, uh, mechanisms uh, with the help of the British mandate. The problem was that it could not become a majority. It remained a minority, uh, despite um, the assistance and sometimes um, the lack of assistance by the British, it remained a minority. And that was transformed in 1948. In 1948, the Yishuv became the State of Israel, and the State of Israel transformed itself, as Zionism was about transforming Jews uh, um, from a diasporic people into a national ethnic group. Um, the War of 1948 transformed the issue from a minority into a majority. It is that moment that is now returned, that moment of transforming Zionism into a majority by, expel by expelling the majority that existed there. Very similar to what happened in Eastern Europe, by the way, between the Poles and Ukrainians that I won't go into. And th this is a moment, I think, that has to be considered when we talk not only about the past, but about the future. It is that moment, the transformation of Jews into a national people, the creation of a nation state, and the mechanism that facilitated that by evicting the majority and declaring oneself to be a majority. As you know, in the Declaration of Independence, uh, there, there is talk about the minorities. The, even as that process is happening, the Palestinians are declared to be a minority, even as they're being expelled and the Jews are becoming a majority. This is the moment that, as you say, needs to be recognized if we are to move forward. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering whether you could uh, yeah. respond to that. Well, no, I mean, it's, again, indisputable that that moment of transition occurs in 1948. What I have to say, Omar, you know, is striking to me is to see the audacity of the claim in the 1920s. In conversations that Ben-Gurion has with members of Brit Shalom and others, that the aspiration has become a Jewish state with a Jewish majority. In other words, that goal is not just effectuated in 1948. It is a, a declared goal I mean, Ben Gurion talks about a legislative power sharing in an article in 1917, but by the mid and certainly late 1920s, the goal is a Jewish state with a Jewish majority. And the burden of my argument is that that reflects the internalization of the realization that being a national minority has destructive and perhaps devastating consequences. I don't want to suggest that Ben Gurion, like, as you know, uh, Jabotinsky in that uh, famous premonition from 1927 anticipated the Holocaust. But there was a recognition that following the collapse of, uh, of the Versailles system and mindful of the promise held out by Balfour, it was imperative to be a majority and a, 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 not just a state but a majority. Um, and I think 
one can only understand that, uh, that aspiration. Um, well, well, one of the chief factors in understanding that is not simply the presence of nationalism as a resonant and recurrent discourse. Um, you yourself noted correctly that most uh, compelling nationalisms of the day were territorial nationalism where the nation imagined or otherwise was proximate to or resident on the terrain that it called its home. Not so in the case of the Jews. And I think that dissonance um, very often manifested itself, manifested itself, led to um, or was caused by anti-Semitism. If I were to isolate the factors that led to the movement of Jews to Palestine, I would say nationalism alone does not explain it. Without the presence and persistence of anti-Semitism, that movement would not have been propelled forward uh, in the way that it was. It would not have been. Um, it would not have created that sense of urgency already in the 1920s to create a majority Jewish state. It would not have created the perception that to be a national minority is to be in a state of uh, perpetual uh, vulnerability. So I, I guess I want to push us back in time to see the roots of 48 um, as European and very much as rooted um, in uh, that persistent um, and alas still present maladies known as anti-Semitism. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.